Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Nature Press Briefing. My name is Faye, and I'll be a coordinator for today's conference. For the duration of the call, you'll be on listen only. However, at the end of the call, you will have the opportunity to ask questions. If at any time you need assistance, please press star zero on your telephone keypad, and you'll be connected to an operator. I'm now handing you over to Ruth Francis to begin today's call. Thank you. Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Nature and Science press briefing concerning two papers. Firstly, a map of human genome variation from population scale sequencing, which will be published by Nature this week. And a second paper, diversity of human copy number variation and multi-copy genes, published by Science. And um, we've also got on the phone today the SIPAC director, Cathy Wren. Um, before we begin, can I remind you all that the papers and this press briefing subject to our usual embargo of 1800 London time, 1300 US Eastern time, tomorrow, Wednesday the 27th of October. First of all, we're going to hear from three of the authors of the papers. We've got um, first Dr. Richard Durbin of the Wellcome Trust Sanger Institute, then Evan Eisler, Professor at the University of Washington, and we've also got, we're going to hear from Professor David Altshuler of the Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard. We also, for the purposes of the Q&A session, have Dr. Lisa Brooks from the National Human Genome Research Institute. Um, so we're going to start off with um, some comments from three of the speakers, and then we'll go to questions. I'm handing over to Richard now. Thank you, and hello, everybody. So 10 years ago, the draft human uh, genome reference sequence was published. But we know that uh, individuals' genomes differ, and a main focus of human genetics is to identify which of these differences or genetic variants contribute towards our tendencies uh, to disease. And in the last 10 years, DNA sequencing technology has advanced dramatically, so it has become feasible to systematically sequence many people to find genetic variants and build a catalog which uh, we can use as a basis for investigations into disease genetics and which, which variants may be functional. So a few years ago, uh, an international consortium was founded, the Thousand Genomes Project, to carry out this uh, plan to produce a, a catalog of genetic variation. And in this week's Nature we issue, we um, are publishing the results of the initial pilot phase of the Thousand Genomes Project. Uh, already, just in the pilot phase, we've uh, identified over 15 million genetic differences by looking at 179 people. Over half of those differences have never been seen, hadn't been seen before. And in doing so, these have already provided a, a more complete catalog of, of variation than uh, was available previously. And an example is that if you look at one person's genome, uh, amongst the three million variants which that individual will have, over 95% of them would be present in our catalog. So just as important as discovering the variation, uh, this has been a, a real shift in, in how we can, how we can uh, approach human genetics. And we've uh, developed, in conjunction with the manufacturers of the machines, who also were part of the uh, project, uh, methods for using sequencing uh, effectively and efficiently in, in, uh, uh, high, in human genetics. And we've tested three different approaches and are taking two of them forwards to a full, the full-scale project to produce a, a, a deeper and broader catalog, which is already underway, which will study 2,500 people. And I think David, at the end, uh, uh, will, will come back to this later. So the paper primarily describes the, the, uh, the, the, the new sets of variants we find and the methods uh, that we used, or initially describes those. It also describes uh, analyses that we can perform now. We have a more complete data set uh, than um, which were previously not not accessible, and uh, there are a number of um, uh, you know key points which are picked out in the in the in the paper and in the uh, uh, in the press release. Uh, in particular, we can see that each individual is carrying a significant number uh, of deleterious mutations, maybe 250 or 300 genes, uh, which. Uh, have defective copies. Um, we can also look at the effects of, of recent evolution on the human genome and the effects of natural selection around genes and uh, between populations. Um, but this is a, 
In fact, on your start, a key property of the project is that all the results are being made publicly available uh, on the web, just as the original reference genome was. And then people both within the project and outside are already beginning to use uh, the data for many different uh, approaches. And um, in particular, because we're looking at all the DNA when we, when we do DNA sequencing, rather than just looking at known places of variation, as has been used uh, in, the, in, in, in GWAS studies, it's possible to examine more complex types of genetic variation. And so um, uh, Evan Eichler, who is going to talk next, has been, this group have been looking, using the 1,000 Genomes data for a particular analysis of uh, copy number variation. Um, so I'll hand over to Evan. Okay. Hello, everyone. This is Evan Eichler. Uh, I'm going to discuss the companion piece that was published in Science. Um, I'm really going to pick up where Richard left off, uh, talking about uh, really an effort to try to extract more information from the roughly 15 percent of the genome that has been very difficult to assay, but is generally described as inaccessible. The work I'm going to describe is really the work primarily of two th third-year students, uh, Peter Sudmont and Jacob Kitzman, um, uh, in, in the University of Washington. So the focus of the science piece, uh, like I said, is to pick up on looking at more difficult regions of the genome. We focus specifically on the copy and content of duplicated genes. And these have been particularly difficult because of their repetitive nature. So there's a roughly about 1,000 genes within the human genome that I would argue have been largely inaccessible to traditional genetic study um, as a result of their repetitive na nature. So what did we do? In this pet paper, we essentially take all the data from the 1,000 Genomes Project in addition to about a dozen other genomes that are not part of the 1,000 Genomes Project, and we essentially remap it using our own computational me measures. Um, when we do this, we essentially assay two properties of that data. We measure the read depth as an indicator of how many copies there are of a given gene family. So this can range from zero copies to dozens, in some cases, you know, many dozens of, of copies. And then we identify unique sequence tags, a, a total of 4.1 million of them, that allow us to essentially distinguish one copy from each of its, its nearest neighbors. So this provides us the ability to assay both the copy and content for any region of the genome, and in principle, uh, any gene in the genome, really, I think, for the first time. I think what's different from this paper, um, in addition to where we're focusing, and a much more narrow focus than, than the 1,000 Genomes Project, per se, is that we're looking at individual level variation as opposed to uh, variation at the population level. So what did we find? Uh, for us, it was particularly exciting. We think the veil has been lifted for us in terms of a, a whole new level of genetic diversity. And this is really back to copy number differences over gene families. And we find uh, three things which I think are worth highlighting. First, we find that uh, the most copy number of variable genes in the human species map to historically duplicated regions of the genome. So you can think of these almost as accordions of the genome expanding and contract, and tra uh, contracting in terms of their copy number. When we look at the, the four populations that we have access to in this study from the 1,000 genomes, we show that uh, when we compare populations, we see that there is more genetic difference between the populations in these particular regions, at least in terms of copy number, when compared to unique regions of the genome. And when we compare these roughly 159 humans that we've a analyzed to date um, and compare them to that of the great apes, we, we have the ability, I think, uh, pretty clearly to identify the genes and the gene families which have expanded specifically in our lineage of evolution since we separated from that of chimpanzee and gorilla. And what we find here, and even though the numbers are quite small, we find a particularly tantalizing set of genes that are important in terms of neural development, in terms of uh, neuronal migration, um, and we want to focus on these going forward as potential candidates for helping to define some aspect of the human condition. So what we plan to do going forward, I think there are two really big things that are exciting our lab and, and hopefully others as well, is that by developing these methods, I think we can now explore, explore really the functional properties of these, uh, what I can call untouchable genes of the, of the human genome. We can look at expression differences. We can look at changes in terms of methylation. We can look at changes in terms of chromatin configuration. And I think the second and perhaps the most important is that, is that now we can assay the copy and content of these genes. We can begin to do association studies for these gene families, which have often been difficult to assay previously, and look for a particular, particular associations with phenotypes, such as disease, disease susceptibility, and other things. 
Thank you. We're handing over now to David Altshuler. Yes, hello. Uh, thank you uh, for calling in and for the chance to speak with you. Um, uh, so I've been asked to comment briefly on the uh, application of the project and its relevance for medical research. So start just by saying that um, it's clear uh, from the history of genetics of humans, but also of many model systems, that uh, following the genetic contributors to disease can be a powerful tool to discover new clues about the genes and underlying biological basis of diseases, both rare and common. Uh, it's also clear that with evolving technology and given the true complexity of the genetic base of disease, that a more complete understanding will require uh, knowing the entire genome sequence of individuals and of populations and the routine deployment of this information in medical and clinical research. From this uh, uh, application standpoint to medical research, the key challenge in the first phase of discovery is to be able to distinguish those genetic variants that contribute to each disease from a background of many millions per genome that are not involved in that particular disease, a problem of a needle in a haystack. In addition, it's important technically to avoid false positive discovery, uh, claiming there are variants that aren't there or missing important variants, as Evan was saying, that you otherwise couldn't assess. So I think there are three ways in which this project contributes. Uh, the first is that, as Richard mentioned, the project has been a laboratory in which many members of our field have worked together on the methods for sequencing whole genomes. These individuals have come from many countries. They've come from academic institutions and also private companies. And the work has been done in a public-private partnership uh, in, and with all the data available in the public domain and the methods available. And this, I think, has contributed greatly, uh, we hope, to increasing the efficiency and the accuracy and the broad availability of these methods so that they can be deployed in many quarters. Second. Uh, while each of our genomes contains many millions of variants, and some of these are unique to each individual, and I'll turn to those in a second, it's also the case, as our paper describes and has, has actually been clear for many years, that most of the variation in each individual's genome, in each single person's genome, most of it is common variation, meaning that it is shared by people who are apparently unrelated in the general population. And so, one approach that the project is enabling is to systematically and accurately and efficiently test these what are called polymorphisms, variants seen in apparently unrelated individuals, for their relationship to disease. A early first draft of this approach was what are known as genome-wide association studies built on an earlier map of genome variation built by the SNP consortium and the HapMap project. And those genome-wide association studies tested only very common genetic variants, those with high frequencies of 5 and 10 percent and above. And those studies have been successful in identifying hundreds of new clues about the genetic basis of disease. The Thousand Genomes Project makes this approach much more complete and much more powerful by going down uh, to much lower frequencies and also broader range of populations and much more complete data uh, in each frequency range in each population. Second. Some diseases are caused not by uh, variants that are common or that are shared by individuals, but actually variants that are very rare, spontaneous even, arising uh, in an individual, as in the case of a cancer, or uh, very rare arising uh, in a recent ancestor, the mother or the father grandparent of someone. Those will never be contained in a catalog. However, if in DNA sequencing is used to discover all the variation in such individuals or families, the first step in analysis under that model of rare genetic variants is to know which of the millions of genetic variants are in the category of common variants, which can be studied with the other approach uh, conceptually, and which are very rare. And it turns out that that requires a catalog of which are common, or else all one gets out of those sequencing studies in rare genomes is millions of candidates and no real way to hone in on the ones that you care about. And so already, the earliest data from the Thousand Genomes Project has been used in multiple published papers uh, in which uh, individuals sequenced, in one case from Evans Institution, uh, but there are other cases as well, they sequenced a family and they were able to quickly hone in on the disease mutations. And if you read those pap that paper and others like it, the first step is to look in the public database in the Thousand Genomes database and say, which are the common variants? We're going to set those aside for study under a different genetic model. 
and we can hone in on the small number that are unique to each individual. That's the second way. So three ways, actually, in which we think the project contributes to medical research. One, the methods, data, and, uh, and uh, uh, standards that have emerged from this public-private partnership. Two, a, complete, a much more complete uh, database of polymorphisms of all sorts, uh, single-base changes, copy number variants, as Evan told you about, other kinds of structural changes that can be tested systematically for disease. And then third, as if you will, a, uh, a lookup table to allow people whose diseases uh, might best be studied under this different genetic model of rare variants to focus in on those. I'd like to make one final comment before turning it over to questions, uh, which is a, just a, a personal perspective on genetics in medical research. It's clear that disease is influenced by inheritance, but also by environment, by behavior, and by chance. Moreover, it's clear and been clear for a long time, long before the current era, that most diseases are influenced by many genes, and moreover, by many variations in many genes. It is not a simple problem. Nonetheless, uh, we continue to uh, drive as a field towards using DNA technology, and we do this to, to understand or to illuminate disease. And we do this despite knowing each success is just the first step towards a biological investigation of that disease. It's not an answer. It just frames the hypothesis. I think the reason we do this is because we live in a time when one of the great scientific opportunities is to use this new ability to read DNA in our population and to follow up the inherited portion, and it is a technical ability and a conceptual ability that I think has great fruit, but we want to be very careful as a project not to uh, suggest that this uh, framework project is itself medical research because it is simply a foundational tool that is not being done in disease samples, nor to suggest that there are any easy answers that will come, but we do believe that in the long run, uh, this is a very valuable and promising approach to learn new things about the basis of disease, and that if we do that as a field and then biological follow-up occurs, that this has promise uh, to contribute to improvements in the long run in human health. Thanks very much, David, and thanks to uh, Richard and Evan also. Um, so we're going to go over to questions now. Um, just a reminder that we've also got Dr. Lisa Brooks from the NHGRI on the phone if anybody wants to ask her anything. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, if you'd like to ask a question, please press 7 on your telephone keypad. If you change your mind and wish to withdraw your question, please press 7 again. You will be advised when to ask your question. We have a question from the line of Alok Jahar from The Guardian. Please go ahead. Hi, this is Alok Jahar from The Guardian. Um, I've just got a couple of questions about numbers, actually, um, which I hope you could just um, clarify for me. Um, you mentioned that you have a database now, 15 million uh, SNPs, and um, there are also some other numbers in the papers about um, the number of genetic changes that an average person c carries there, that's between 250 and 300. Um, I just wondered if you could tell me how this compares to what we knew already, um, so to just to put it into context of how much further this new set of papers takes us in, in working out diversity between humans. Uh, this is uh, Richard answering. So the numbers of, uh, of total variance per person is actually about 3 million, um, but the numbers of, of genes which uh, appear to have a, 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 a complete loss of function defects in them is, is, the, is the 250 to 300. Those numbers are not that new, but what we've done here is by sequencing, by looking at many people, um, we've each variant that you find in an individual will only be in some members of the population. So uh, the 15 million number is a substantial increase over previous uh, uh, lists and means that we can cover more of the variants present in any one individual. In fact, the, the project as a whole is moving onwards from the 200 or so people studied genome-wide in the pilot um, and now has sequenced over uh, 1,000 people uh, so that data on a thousand people are available, and we can already see this number of 15 million is going to go up, and we're going to get a, a deeper and richer picture going forward. So we're moving; um, if that number is increasing, and will uh, at least double over over the next year. So this, this is David Altshuler. Let me um, uh, just add one other thing to that, which is uh, a number that I personally find uh, just just useful as a way to think about this, because. After a while, millions of variants, whether it's 1 million or 10 million or 15 million, it's hard to have context 
if you're not, if, but here's a number that I think is easy for people to understand. Uh, this idea of the number of genetic variants in each individual. So what we mean by that is, if we were to take a DNA sample, if, if a DNA sample is taken from a reader or any of us, and we sequence it and we de define as the variation in that genome the sites at which the, the copy one inherited from one's mother and the other copy of the genome you inherited from your father differ, all right? That's the number Richard said. There's some three million or so differences between those two copies. Or another way of thinking about it is uh, the differences between an individual uh, and uh, a copy of the genome and that uh, human genome reference sequence that came out of the Human Genome Project. That number is the same. It's just a comparison of any two chromosomes. And it's about uh, three million letters or one in a thousand letters because there's three billion letters, so one in a thousand of three million. Three billion is three million. So now the question is, how much has our knowledge of that variation that we might find in each individual increased over time? So if we go back to two, 10 years to uh, that, what Richard started at the uh, announcement of the human genome sequence, that number would have been that if we sequenced any person's genome and said what fraction of the variation in that genome is in the public database, it would have been 5% or less. In other words, 95% of what was found in the next person's genome was new, not previously seen. At the time of HapMap, maybe five years ago, that number was on the order of 40% or so, 40 or 50%. So in other words, you'd sequence the next, if one had had that technology, it wasn't available at that time, but we now know um, that if you had sequenced a person's genome, said how much of that variation in that person is in that uh, uh, database for SNPs, for these single base changes, would have been 40 or 50%, much less for the kind of structural variant that Evan was telling you about. If you look today for single nucleotide polymorphisms in the pilot data of the 1000 Genomes Project, 95% of what you find in the next person's genome is already in this database, still lower for the kind of variants that Evan's uh, studying because they're harder to study. And we see these numbers going to 98% or something like that for many types of variation. That, In other words, by the time the 1000 Genomes Project's done, each person, if they had their genome sequenced, the vast majority, greater than 95 percent, maybe as much as 98 or 99 percent of the variation in that person would already be in the public database and therefore it could be referenced back and then perhaps one or a few percent of the variation would be unique to that individual not in that database. Thank you. Alok, did you want to follow up on that? No, that's fine. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Next question, please. Thank you. And we have a question from the line of Tina Say from Science News. Please go ahead. Uh, yes, I wanted to follow up on that just a bit. So how many SNPs are currently in the database? And then I have a question about the uh, loss of function genes. Um, so I, I can, so in the, the pilot, um, Coming out of the pilot project, there are 15, just over 15 million SNPs, 15,275,000. Uh, these, many of those, you know, these are not exactly the same as the set of variants which are in dbSNP, which come from all other projects. Um, I don't have a number, number for the total union uh, across all research available today. Um, okay. Um, and then, uh, so you say that each person um, has about 250 to 300 genes that are basically inactivated uh, in their genome. Mm -hmm. um, do those tend to be some of the same genes, or would they be unique genes in each person? And what does that say about disease risk and um, how necessary these genes are? So. There's a mix. Some of those genes uh, are commonly inactivated and maybe genes which uh, are not strongly required. Um, but uh, there are also a, a more gene in the category of these loss of function variants, which include uh, premature stop codons, uh, frame shift mutations, and uh, changes in splicing so that uh, the exons don't get put together properly. Um, in that category is substantially enriched for uh, um, rarer variants, for things that are present just perhaps in one of the uh, 179 people. Um, so uh, it is true that 
And that indicates two things. First, that these probably, many of these are functional, and that the reason why they're not more common is that they've been selected uh, away. There's, there's ne negative selection against them or purifying selection. Uh, it also says that we are each probably carrying um, more or less private, certainly rare, uh, defective copies of genes. They don't necessarily lead to disease directly in the individual. They may. Um, we have two copies of most genes, one from the mother and one from the father, and so if one is defective, you're just a carrier. That can sometimes uh, have a, 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 a phenotypic effect. Right, um, I, I think... Sorry, I was just, just going to add that the, there's been much speculation over the years about the relative contribution of different kinds of genetic variants to the basis of disease. But ultimately, these are questions that can only be answered empirically because all the speculation is based on different assumptions about uh, how uh, the genes and pathways and biology of disease works. What's truly exciting is to live in a time when we have the methods and data to ask those questions empirically. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, what you will, the answer to your question, for example, about what role do these genes that are inactivated play in disease, can be rather straightforwardly evaluated now, not just because of the Thousand Genomes Project, but the general approach, by identifying them and relating them to patients and disease. And so rather than speculate, I think we'd say we are helping to create a foundation to answer that question. And anyone who does speculate, I think, is speculating. There's no way to know short of doing the experiment. And what's exciting is that we now are going to have the tools and methods increasingly to just answer those questions through actual empirical data rather than speculations. And, and people are beginning to do that. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, and just to follow up on uh, the last part of what Richard Durbin was saying, uh, when we talk about a gene being inactivated, it's one of the two copies of the gene that the person has. So we don't, so for, for most people, one version doesn't work these loss of function variants, but generally the other version that the person inherited from the other parent will work. So this would be recessive mutations then? Well, there's one copy of them. If the other one works and the person is perfectly fine because of it, then they are recessive. Yeah, no, but most of the, most of the variants that we're seeing in this way are for our carrier status of uh, diseases known as recessive diseases, although it's not always the case. In fact, in very few examples, has, has there ever been large-scale study of uh, people who are carriers to know if they have any, uh, any disease risk? Okay. One, one of the surprising things um, is that actually um, most disease genes have been studied either uh, in, have, to the extent, disease genes meaning those that cause rare, strong genetic diseases, have largely, not in every case, but in most cases, only been studied in people who have those diseases. So the broader population relevance of, the, of, of having a variant in those genes is actually not well characterized because it hasn't been possible to do studies of this sort until now. And so when you sometimes read about someone saying someone had a part of their genome or their whole genome sequence and they were found to have a mutation that causes a disease and yet they're apparently healthy. That's more a statement about it not having been possible previously to do that kind of empirical study rather than a shocking finding. Okay. And the, this is um, Ruth. I'm just going to remind the speakers if you can say who you are when you're answering. I think I got a bit confused there, but um, next question, please. Thank you. The next question comes from the line of Nicholas Wade from the New York Times. Please go ahead. Oh, hi, David. Can I ask you to clarify the uh, cutoff point between common and rare variants? And I think it was like what well, you just said now, it was 5% in the HapMap days. So w when you've reached the point of having 98% of variation in your database, um, what will be the, uh, uh, the definition of a, of a SNP at that stage? Sure. So let me, let me just, there's a couple of ways to answer this question. Um, first of all, I think that the, uh, personally, well, there's the classical definition sort of in the textbooks of what is a common variant or what's known as a polymorphism, and that number is 1% or higher in the population. And um, in the era of uh, HapMap uh, and the SNP consortium, given the technology that was available at the time, 
um, there were the the sort of uh, frequency to which that resource went was down to between five or ten percent. And the first uh, 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 set of genome-wide association studies were a variance of five, ten percent, and above. Um, things below that frequency, first of all, would still be uh, down to one percent. Would still be classical polymorphisms. That's the term that's been used. But I think actually the most meaningful conceptual framework is the one that I used in my opening comments, which is there are two types of variants. There are those that are present in apparently unrelated individuals from inherited from shared ancestors uh, that can be cataloged and then studied for relationship to disease, and that goes down somewhere below 1%. Uh, and then there's ones that are unique to each family or individuals, which I think would be well called rare or private mutations, and those are much, much less frequent. The numbers I cited to answer your question about 98, 99% is for a frequency of 1% and above. So uh, it, it's not, once yeah, you sorry. have the, the 99, 98% in your database, uh, what percentage of the, quote, missing inheritability do you believe you will have captured? I have no idea because that calls for speculation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. I, I, really, I, I really consider it a complete, a, a question of empirical data, and I think that, frankly, there's been too much speculation. I think that what we know is that there are rare variants that influence disease because that's been documented for decades. And we know that there are common variants that influence disease uh, because there are documented examples. And I think the question of sort of a complete understanding is probably many years in the future where we've explained every, if we ever will, explain all the inheritance. But I think the promising and exciting thing is we are actually for the first time as a field uh, making progress, at least honing in on uh, the many genes that contribute to each disease. Well, so Others may want to comment. If a major part of the burden is, is borne by these very rare variants, which I assume mostly sort of spontaneous mutations, then it could be we will come up pretty empty-handed. Eminently rational as this approach is, um, our catalog might not help us. I mean, I think, well, well, this is, this is good. I think this, I think this idea that this divide in the, in the sand that we have in terms of percentage is really, I think, to be honest, totally bogus. What we want to be able to do is we want to be able to look at genomes comprehensively, not just as a function of frequency of small variants, but in terms of the full spectrum of genetic variation, ranging from single base pair changes to insertion deletion events to larger C and V events, so copy number variant changes. And I think, I mean, if, I, I, I can't imagine that if we come up, came up empty-handed. If we just look at things, for example, from the copy number variation perspective, you know, at, the, at this point today now with technology that we have, we can pretty much uh, diagnose about 20% of kids with mental retardation or intellectual disability as having a large copy number variation event. Sometimes it's sporadic, sometimes it's been inherited for a very few generations, but the bottom line is that it's highly impactful. So this, I think there's a lot of yield to come from uh, studies of genetic variation, but I think the point that we have to keep our, you know, keep the, keep our eye on is that we need to actually uh, divorce ourselves from this idea of frequency and move to really a comprehensive assessment of all forms of genetic variation. And I think if we do that, we'll be able to actually link phenotype fairly well. And I think, I mean, I think that's where we are right now with the technologies that are coming online to sequence genomes, to you know, comprehensively assay structural variation, to sequence exomes. I believe that this is this is the era where we're going to actually make huge huge inroads in terms of genetic basis or understanding the genetic basis of human disease. Thank you. But I, I, think, I think the last point, and I made this in my opening comments, is that I think that the, the Thousand Genomes Project, uh, we mentioned each of us uh, in our own way, three different things, uh, three different ways in which this project contributes, one of which is methods, standards, uh, part, uh, sort of a uh, public-private collaboration of companies and academics all working together to make the technology work for any application. I think that that is a contribution under any uh, disease uh, model. And then I think that, as Evan said, we want to be comprehensive, and the exact deployment of the resource will differ depending on uh, the different approaches people take. But I actually think that the, actually the documented value of the Thousand Genomes Project for medical research just in the first year is actually more under the model that Nick uh, Wade just mentioned of rare genetic variants. It's a necessary step in how you interpret a rare, a rare variant model to know the common variants. So I think it would be mis- 
uh, just so people aren't confused, uh, this project is not about any given model. It's about what Evan said, which is a comprehensive approach. It's not about any particular underlying model. It's about testing all the models. Thanks, everyone. Um, next question? Yeah, our next question comes from the line of Michael Price from the Washington Examiner. Please go ahead. Uh, yes, uh, my question is for Evan. I'm getting away from the diseases a little bit. When you're talking about the genes associated with neural development, I was wondering if you could um, let me know if those were related to specific regions of the brain or, or processes or connections or anything like that, um, I guess, uh, how you tied that back to neural development. Yeah, so, I mean, what we did is actually, I mean, we did a formal test to see which genes were, you know, enriched or which genes had been specifically duplicated in the human lineage. And we used some of these programs that have been developed to look at gene classes. And neurodevelopment came up significant, but only modestly so. Um, but when you actually look at the specific examples, they're actually quite striking. So as, as an example, there's this gene known as SIRGAP2. Um, and it's actually duplicated specifically in the human lineage. Uh, we don't know the function, or we actually don't know the role, or even if the, the duplicated copies are totally functional. But what we do know is that there are multiple copies of SIRGAP2, and, and the parent gene, SIRGAP, is in fact important in terms of neuro, neuronal migration in the frontal cortex. And so it's expressed, and there's a beautiful paper published in Cell about a year ago that looked into this, and it's really the kind of the spatial temporal expression of SIRGAP2, which dictates how far neurons actually migrate in the cortex and then begin their kind of arborization or lateralization process. So I think it's, to me, it's, you know, it's just an anecdote. I mean, you've got to be careful not to get too excited about these anecdotes. But when you start looking at all the genes that, that we find that are duplicated and, and pretty much often fixed in all humans that we look at, but not so in the chimp or gorilla, we see a, a significant number of genes that, that would be particularly sexy candidates um, for, um, I, I don't know if the right word is with human mentation, but essentially mm -hmm. development or neurogenesis. And so this is something that we would like to pursue, and I think it's an understudied area uh, where people have been looking at, you know, human evolution. They've been focusing mainly on, again, the tractable regions of the genome, that 90% that's uh, easily assayable. Thank you. Next question. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Please be reminded, if you do wish to ask a question, please press 7 on your telephone keypad now. And a final reminder, to ask a question, please press 7 on your telephone keypad now. We currently have no further questions coming through. Okay, um, I will just take the time then to say thanks to everybody for dialing in to today's briefing and thanks to the speakers for their time. Um, if you need any more information, please don't hesitate to consult um, us or the Science Press Office. Um, once again, I can want to remind you of the nature and science embargoes on these papers, which is 6 p.m. London time, 1 p.m. U.S. Eastern tomorrow, Wednesday the 27th of October. There will be a recording of this briefing on the Nature Press site and science will make that available to under embargo. Many thanks.